he's not entitled to our own facts. Um, there are a lot of facts that are missing from the discussion that Ms. Lee made. And uh, in particular, the natural gas industry is one of the most highly regulated industries in the United States. And then coming off of Pennsylvania, the DEP and all the other agencies that oversee uh, natural gas exploration uh, operations along with all the other activities that support it, um, I assure you, those agencies are heavily engaged and involved with us and on our sites. The, um, the information that she provided, there's a lot of inaccuracies. I look forward to it as we continue this panel to help counter and provide some actual facts and some resources in which you can do your own um, ed education and research and then you'll learn on your own exactly what really is happening. Um, uh, Professor Lee, I thought, gave a uh, a strong indictment of the abuse of corporate power. And I'd just like to focus on one aspect of this, uh, which uh, is something uh, that Courtney said, which is that the, the general view of the gas industry, and I think many corporate developments, is we've got to do this, we've got to do it right now, it's important, it'll give us jobs, it'll develop the country. And if we screw up the environment, if hundreds of thousands of people get injured, die, there are all sorts of illnesses that occur, well, we can fix it later. Uh, you know, we could go back and figure out how to clean up the waters. We could figure out how to uh, uh, rid the air of all our pollutants. Uh, my perspective, and from a legal perspective, I have a, a, a different view, which is that I think before you in, involve yourself in dangerous, inherently dangerous activities, activities which we know have a great risk of polluting groundwaters, polluting the air, and harming our communities and our citizens, we should conduct the investigations that are necessary to figure out whether it can be done safely, and if so, how. Decisions on fracking may then be made by people completely outside the community. 
So should interests of the local communities outweigh competing outside interests? And in general, where should the right to make such decisions reside? Again, the local communities or at the state or federal level. So, uh, so assuming that you all want to answer these questions, we'll just start, uh, I guess, from those closest to me and you can each take a turn. These are certainly very important questions, and they're not questions even um, just about fracking. Um, they're about um, what embodies are really about what we mean by our democracy. Um, where should those powers lie? How should they be distributed? In what way should they be recognized? Um, I've been really involved in the Pennsylvania anti-fracking campaign, but I've, I've also been very involved in uh, New York because they have a moratorium. Um, and one of the things that really importantly distinguishes what's happened in Pennsylvania, we've effectively been hit by a small freight train. We're about to be hit by a much larger one once the gas is ready for export to the global market. Um, but what they have in New York is something called Home Rule, which empowers their local municipalities, their local communities in ways that we simply do not enjoy in Pennsylvania. And so they have municipalities that have erected moratoriums or bans um, until such a time, should there ever be such a time, that there's sufficient science that can show that they can make it such that they can make a decision that they want to have fracking in their communities. Part of what's made it very difficult in Pennsylvania is after team. After team effectively um, Terrorists from universities, or not universities, from communities, from these, univers from these communities of any of the powers they might otherwise have to make decisions within their own municipalities about whether and how, and in some ways, most importantly, where a fracking operation is going to occur. And those decisions are made at the state level of government. Municipalities are offered what I would regard as, frankly, a bribe in exchange and in terms of the impact fee which is a terribly poor version of a severance fee, severance tax, um, and it disempowers municipalities and communities to make any meaningful decisions about what happens within their borders. So it seems to me that until we resolve those kinds of fundamental issues, until we have a rule, um, that we are going to be saddled in our communities um, with the consequences of decisions over which we really had no say at all. I, I would probably prefer that Professor Lowe will go first and then maybe work back down this way because like, he's the attorney and we'll teach the law school. I probably would prefer. Let's, let's mix it up a little bit and go down. Fine. And you're fine. You're fine. You're fine. You're fine. You're fine. You're fine. I don't care what I say. <laughs> um, I'd like to answer the question two ways. One is to give you folks some background as to this home rule question and uh, my view on it, and then probably uh, try to present a broader perspective on this issue. Uh, I was involved in the Pittsburgh uh, anti trafficking statute. I was an activist in Pittsburgh, and I worked with the city council. I testified before the city council. And we enacted in Pittsburgh a ban on fracking. And uh, there were a number of communities in the uh, western Pennsylvania area that wanted to follow Pittsburgh's lead. But the Supreme Court and the uh, state legislature had at that point, two years ago, uh, had a, a law legislation and court precedent which said local communities can decide where uh, uh, gas operations can take place. They can use zoning to ameliorate the effects of gas operations, but they can't ban it totally. And uh, the, the uh, gas companies uh, threatened to sue any municipality which uh, enacted a ban. And that prevented most of the, almost all of the municipalities besides Pittsburgh from following our lead. Uh, because we only had very limited home rule, namely you could decide where to put these, uh, you could decide you can't put a gas well in the, res the residential area, only in the industrial area, but you couldn't ban it. Well, that was not enough for the legislation, legislature and for the corporate interests. 
So they got the legislation to enact uh, this Act 13, which precludes even the zoning uh, uh, regulation. It says local communities which historically have had zoning powers to decide where different types of activities should take place, where a gas activity, where an industrial activity, where residential should take place, no longer have that power. Uh, or at least it minimizes it enormously. And I totally agree with Professor Lee that that uh, is an undemocratic uh, uh, principle. But I'd like to speak to a little broader problem. When this act was passed, and my hunch is that the fellow speakers on this panel, because I've been on other panels where they've said that, uh, uh, argued that we need uniformity throughout the state. The reason that take away local home rule on this is that the gas companies are faced with too many regulations, there's too many different communities have different, different perspectives, and we need uniformity. In fact, they said our legal fees are going up, and this was like uh, creating work for lawyers, all these zoning, zoning regulations, which I said was a good thing, but uh, <laughs> they didn't like it. Um, so they argued we need uniform state legislation. Well, let me present what happened the year before this act was passed. There was congressional hearings on whether the Federal Environmental Protection Agency should develop a national minimum standard to protect our nation's water from environmental problems associated with fracking. At that point, the Pennsylvania Environmental Protection Secretary, Michael Prancer, objected. He said, we need local control over drilling. You can't have national uniform standards. And the reason you can't have national uniform standards is one size doesn't fit all, he said, and I'm quoting. Each state has unique, specialized needs, specialized geography, which state officials know best. And Republican Congressman Schuster and Democratic Congressman Altmaier said they would fight to preserve local control over this fracking process, meaning local state power as opposed to this menacing federal power, which is going to create national minimum standards. So how do you explain this contradiction? between the legislation, state legislation saying we don't want local control when it's local communities saying what to do, but we want local control when it's state uh, 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 ability to control it versus the federal government. Well, to me there's a consistency. And the consistency is when you look at the interests underlying both views, which is in both cases they were fighting to, to preserve corporate power preserve corporate independence from federal regulation, and to preserve corporate independence from local, namely community regulation. And so the real question in this whole local versus uh, national debate is not simply democratic control versus uh, state or you know, foreign control, but it's really who's doing the controlling? Whose interests are, are being controlled in the map? And that's why I think you got you didn't get this inconsistency. Uh, but uh, I'm a strong believer that local communities should have the power to regulate activities that can uh, devastate. The
and with the county emergency management folks and with um, community groups as we talk about what happens with our operations. We contact schools and we find out what times are the school buses going on the roads so that our trucks will not be on the roads at the same time. And we take a look at things such as if you're working with um, lands that involve the state game lands or any other kind of state entity, working closely with that commission on the use of those lands and the locations and the development. So this isn't something that's done in a vacuum or arbitrarily. And along with that is how we go about doing it. You know, safety is a priority for the industry, and we do emphasize safety every single day and throughout the day. And also, how we actually do our development is just as important. I you know there were some comments made as to how the industry is actually operating, and when in fact, there are a lot of, as I mentioned, a lot of rules and regulations in place. But we do spend a lot of time in techno technological <coughs> development and in using what we know our best practices and best procedures to help with the development in a safe, responsible manner. You know, we're not out there to willy-nilly go out and start, you know, destroying the environment. That's something that doesn't make any sense. You know, the natural gas industry has been around in the United States, actually started in Pennsylvania back in the 1800s. And since that time, Pennsylvania has had a whole slew of uh, shallow wells, and it wasn't until recently that people started paying attention to the new technology that was developed to where we can access the deeper shale reserves. And that horizontal drilling itself has allowed us the opportunity to do that. But educating our community and educating our landowners and giving folks the opportunity to have input is important to us and we do meet with a lot of different organizations, individuals, and community groups to do that. First of all, just to let me um, take a step back and just tell you a little bit about how my knowledge came to me with the gas industry because I think it's important to have an understanding. My knowledge in the gas industry started by helping landowners understanding the risks associated with these gas leases. I represented the landowners, didn't work for the gas companies. It wasn't like I was supporting the industry. But there were a lot of struggling farmers, a lot of struggling landowners, a lot of people that had land and generate in their families for generations who were going to be unable to keep these lands. And they did see a lottery ticket that they didn't know they owned. And they did see an opportunity to make money from them, right, wrong, or indifferent, regardless of where you sit on this position, understand how this came to be. There's an opportunity for these landowners to reap a benefit from owning the land. So I educated them. These lease documents are negotiated instruments. A lot of the landmen that came out with very early gas companies were taken advantage of. I was one of them. We signed a gas lease on some property we had. It was a bad lease. They were able to take everything. But as I learned, I learned how to protect these landowners and educate them. And this is an educational process. Just like you go to school, you go to university, you go to high school, you go to the restaurant. You educate yourself on the risks that are associated with these industries and how you protect yourself. So these leases, you needed to go see an attorney. And as people learn more about it, they put in the language into these leases that protected them and the interests around them. First and foremost, I believe the landowner should have a say so in what they have with their property. Second of all, second of all, it should reside in the local community because they do know what affects them most readily, what activities. What goes on in Bradford County is not the same that goes on in West Mullen County. What goes on in Allegheny County is not the same that goes on in West Mullen County. We have more rural property. I disagree with Wendy from the standpoint of New York. It's the fact that New York has a lot of farmland. And outside of New York City, over 80% of their landowners want gas fracking. They want wells. They want gas development. And if you look up into your home or money, you'll see that they want it. And they've done studies on it. So first of all, that. Second of all, Pennsylvania is guided by what are called blue sky laws. It means that we own everything above the earth and everything in the center of the earth. These landowners own that unless it's deeded off separately. <coughs> so they do own these things and they can control you know, what goes on with the, the surface below their property. And the gas companies can not go on it. They know where the drill heads are, they know what they're doing. So, but what Act 13 tried to do 
was to propose, and I implore all the local municipalities that have met, we need to get together and find out what your protections are that you wanted to see in that person. If you wanted 2,000 feet from a, piece, from a stream or a waterway, put that into the legislation, propose it. If you wanted 3,000 feet from a school, you put it in it. The problem is that there was a lot of misguided things that went into Act 13 that I don't believe that it was written by people that understand the industry or understand the risks associated. And I think that hopefully through this case and hopefully through further development, we will put restrictions in these laws that protect our interests and where we're going and, and where the industry is going because I'm here to say the industry is much more soft. And these forms are great. I, I applaud Professor Lowell and I applaud Wendy because it's good to get both sides of these structures. I'm not against either one of them. The point is we need to talk about it, we need to know the risk, we need to have mature adult discussions about these so that we can put the protections in place to protect all of us and our future generations. Well, that's true. 
There is no scientific evidence that has proved that water and sand and the additives that are used that are sent about a mile to a mile and a half below ground can defy gravity and, and seep through impermeable rocks or layers upon layers, approximately 4,000 feet of it, to contaminate the water aquifer. Now, that doesn't mean that in the process of hydraulic fracturing, there haven't been problems. There is the risk of, of spills. There is the risk of leaks. And that's the human error element. And those are the kinds of things that the industry takes very seriously and does mitigate for. You know, one of the things that we do as a company is we use a closed loop system. And before we do any kind of hydraulic fracturing operations, we do pressure tests of everything that we're using in that system using fresh water. So that if there's a problem with the leak, the only thing that leaks out is water. And then we make the adjustments and we, we pressure test every single time before we do the next stage of a hydraulic fracturing job. So for example, in one well, you can do approximately 15 to 20 stages of hydraulic fracturing um, operations, you know, the actual fracturing operations. Before every single one of those, we pressure test our lines, we pressure test every fitting, we pressure test the well heads that are used to ensure that everything's safe and that um, we're not going to have any leaks. And so in that system, that's what we do. The other thing we look at is there's a lot of allegations as to, you know, when the risk and everything that we have, you know, have the potential of over 400 chemicals, you know, going down that hole and contaminating the community. When in fact, um, there's a possibility that the industry can select from a variety of uh, chemicals to use in their process. But in reality, we only use about four or five. So it depends upon the company what they're using and how much they're using it. But for WPX, if you go on frackfocus.org, that is a public website, and it is run by um, an independent organization, and you can go and you can search by operator and see what are they using in their wells when they hydraulically fracture. So if you take a look at uh, what we're using as a company, you know, one of the things I did was bring a list so that, um, make sure I get this correct. See that site you move their And frackfocus.org provides um, the listing of what we use. And in reality, some of the things that, we, everything that we use is used in human products. They're used in humans and pets. You know, they use anywhere for medical uses, for uh, shampoos, air fresheners, cosmetics, <coughs> hair coloring. You know, all those kinds of things um, in, the, in all the biodegradable and human consumption chemicals that we use in our hydraulic fracturing operations. So what you choose to do and how you choose to do business just, is just as important as, um, you know, and actually more important than doing the actual business. So that's a priority for our company, and that's something that I think everyone needs to look at for each company. You know, is how do they go about mitigating those risks? And so one of the things we, we do is to choose to use biodegradable kind of products in our hydraulic fracturing operations. We use an air hammer bit when we drill down to our kickoff point where we first go into the horizontal level, into the Marcellus Shale. So the only thing we're using is air as we drill down. And so those are the kinds of things that companies are doing and it's not a static industry. You know, the industry is constantly evolving and constantly developing innovations. And so, you know, it's, it's not something that people can just sit, sit back and say, we don't care, because we are. We learn every single day. And we're developing every single day. And this has evolved since the 1800s to the point where now our country has gas reserves that, um, you know, can meet our needs for years and years to come. <coughs>
live in a free country, and I'm not saying that we should be careless in how we manage things, but I think you get perilously close to not obeying the Constitution. The Constitution of the United States, our forefathers moved to this country because of the fact that they were told what to do. And I know the UN has an agenda 21 that they are trying to push and basically controls the use of landowners and what they can do with their property. I think we need to be smart and safe about it and responsible in what we do. But for us to take a stage or a step where we actually, you know, tell a landowner that if they want to buy 100 acres that they can't do on that property, something that obviously we don't want to hurt the community, but to prevent these landowners who have owned these properties for 150 years to not be able to utilize the property in a safe and responsible manner that's already allowed by the law to use that property. I think it's perilously close to uh, you know, not allowing the Constitution to work in the way that it was originally written by our forefathers. Let me say in response to that two things. One is the Constitution of Pennsylvania has a very strong uh, provision giving all citizens the right to clean water, clean air, and, 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 and as the constitutional protection of the right to property in our constitution. And I would suggest that you're ignoring that constitutional protection. That's number one. Number two, it strikes me as odd for you to say that communities should have rights, but that a community cannot decide. You have a little village, a thousand people in town. They say there is some noxious, uh, a substance which one landowner wants to introduce. And the community gets together, has a democratic discussion, like we're having here. You folks come, you convince the community, you, you argue. This substance is totally safe, don't worry about it. Somebody else comes and says, it'll destroy your homes, it'll destroy your water, it'll destroy your air. The community discusses it as I think our heritage and our values and our constitution suggest we should. And it comes to the conclusion that they don't want to take the risk that this could destroy the community. And you are saying that the community has no right to do this because the single landowner uh, right trumps the right of everybody else to live safely. That is not the law. That's not what our constitution says. Our constitution allows that we have a whole public nuisance law which allows landowners, if you, if you own a prop, piece of property and somebody is engaged in a public nuisance right next to you, you can go to court and get that stopped. And I don't see why a community can't say, this is a public nuisance and we want it stopped. And the only reason, not the Constitution, because I've read all the cases and there's no constitutional provision which says a community can't do it. You know the only reason? The only reason is the legislation, the, the uh, statutory preemption that the legislature enacted. If the legislature removes that statutory preemption, these communities will have that right again.
The potential for accident involves thousands of trucks. It involves water withdrawals. It involves water impoundments. It involves open pit waste pools, and they still exist in Pennsylvania. The the cheap frack organizations, the ones who are running on the fly, particularly Inflection, who is effectively just a front company for an Asian hedge fund, it still has open waste pits behind the Baptist Church on Route 87. And so if we don't consider all of this from cradle to grave, and if we don't recognize that the destruction of water guarantees that there is no such thing as a closed loop, the destruction of water is permanent. A fracking corporation that tells you it recycles its water, it will use its water, the frack water, over and over again for a period of time. Right? What comes back up, which is only about a third of it in the flowback, right? but eventually that water is so polluted, it is so contaminated, and this is not dish detergent. This is tooling, this is benzene, this is diesel. It is so contaminated, it has to go into deep injection wells. Then it has to be trucked out. Then it may be going to Ohio. Then it's on Route 220 or on other routes where there will be school buses. And if we think that there's some orchestration to ensure that those trucks will not be on the roads with those school buses, we are fools. that I'm just not going to ask tonight because we'll be here for the rest of the night. Uh, we did get started late, and um, uh, so I don't mind ending a, a couple minutes late, but what occurs to me as we have this discussion uh, very clearly is that this is one issue that has a lot of interest on the community and that this is a, this is a good conversation for us as a community to have. So I would like to uh, allow Maybe just two short questions and realize that that is clearly sufficient. Let's get a couple of questions. Uh, Judge, my, my question is very short. Uh, my question is very short. I, I think we've got, uh, can we just take all the names and faces out of this talk? I think we can. Can extraction be that? No. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> So it's, it's not the, the means to the end that is, is the subject of the slide it's, it's the end itself that's like Is that what you're saying? When you consider that at the end of the day, that what we're doing contributes in really substantial ways to climate change and the kinds of implications and consequences that are going to come from the anthropogenic contributions to climate change, no. It is inherently destructive. It is dangerous to environment. It is massively dangerous to human and non-human health. No, it cannot be done safely. Yes, it can. And the EPA just came out with their results on greenhouse gases and emissions. Wait, wait, wait. No, wait, wait. Can extraction of, of, of any element, coal, gas, any. Is there somewhere to make? How do you measure the would we not surely do better to be spending our money, our time, our energy, our talent, and our creative imaginations on the alternatives that already exist that we simply don't pursue, and on conservation that if we don't begin to take seriously, there will be no alternative or no state of alternatives that are going to save us from the consequences of the end of all. Ethically, natural gas um, can be extracted in a safe, responsible manner. And the extraction of all different types of fossil fuels, whether it's coal or natural gas, um, natural gas, liquids, oil, all of those fuels are an integral part of our energy op operations here in the United States and throughout the world. That's what has fueled our society to where we are today. We are in a stagnant society. When we started back in the Industrial Revolution, my gosh, we've had so much change since then and so much advancement since then. You know, we're still not operating like we were back when the Industrial Revolution started. We've made great inroads. And so, same thing here. As the industry and all the other various energy industries 
take a look at their operations to include problems with solar and wind. You know, um, I know Ms. Uh, Lee likes to say that the uh, natural gas industry has problems. Oh, gosh, I didn't know um, recently that the solar industry has its own problems and, and solar panels are considered hazardous waste. Uh, unless they're installed. So, I mean, those kinds of things, and those kinds of issues aren't explored by the same group that wants to tout problems with natural gas. So if we're going to talk about ethics, let's talk about looking at everything. Looking at everything in a clear, factual, scientific manner, not in the emotional allegations and claims that are made that are unsubstantiated. Extracted safely, uh, and uh, to me, uh, at this point, I think the scientific evidence is not, is not that it can be extracted safely. In fact, at this point, I would argue that it can't be extracted safely. But I think the broader ethical problem is: Are we as a society uh, developing our resources, uh, develop, developing energy in a way? that comports with our ethical obligations both for future generations and for our own, our own uh, uh, world and the, the, the environment. And there I agree totally with Professor Lee that we are acting generally in an unethical way. And this natural gas rush here is just one aspect of that. Brought. And I think we should step back and look at that broader ethical problem and not say, well, is gas better than coal? Or, you know, which one of these things should we be doing? But are we generally acting towards our environment and in our world? Yeah. Okay, um, can I answer? I just want to say one, one thing. Um, I, I think that it's important to understand, I'll go back to one of my comments originally. It's an industrial operation. There are risks inherent. With you getting in your car tonight and driving home, there are risks with anything we produce in this country. There's risks with it. I don't think that anybody could truly sit up here I think what Susan is trying to say is that they can do it in such a manner that it is as safe as possible. There's always human error involved in anything that we do in this country. If we decide to do more wind, we do more hydraulic, or we do electric, or we build the cars, we build the batteries, <coughs> there's so much that comes out of the wet gas as far as piling and the other things that take to make the products that make those, energy, those cleaner energies possible. Those don't come just because they're laying on the ground and you walk out in your front yard and you can pick a blade of grass and make them. But they come from a certain thing. You have to look at the overall picture of where the plastics come from and where the other elements that make up the batteries come from. I mean, whether we like it or not, as a developed country, these things are inevitable. The lights that, you know, each one of us drove here in a car now. That car is made of plastic. It's made up of metal. You know, where did the metal come from? We had to take the coke out of the ground. You know, we have just proven, you know, as a society, the United States is, is a developed country. And unfortunately or fortunately, those things don't come without some sort of risk or some sort of impact on our life, unfortunately. And for future generations, yes, it is a risk. There's some concern with it. And what's going to happen and where do we go? But I'm sure our grandparents had the same concerns whenever they were doing things. And I'm sure that our, our children and their grandparents will have the same risk. We just have to make the steps that we can make to make it as safe as possible to achieve the life that we all desire to live. And that's the choices we make in this life, and that's where we've gotten where we are with our clothes, our cars, everything that we do with day in and day out. Uh, just, I want to make sure we have one last question. The gentleman had his hand up for quite a while here, so. Um, and then, when we're done with this, the, those of you, you know, who would like to stay and continue the conversation more formally, we can do that. The rest of you who would like to refreshments can go to them too. So, the What's that? The
we're working with a family out in Hamwell Township. Um, mm -hmm. She uh, and her family were infected with arsenic poisoning. Now, before they underwent the well, they had to sign the lease and everything. They got money to release. Now, if something was to go wrong after they signed the lease involving the company, do they get some form of compensation afterwards because it was effective, because there was complications afterwards? Pennsylvania state law is very clear regarding company responsibilities in the um, area of operations. And if you look at um, Act 13, you know, some folks don't like it, but if you look at Act 13, um, there is a presumption of responsibility on a natural gas company within uh, 2,500 feet of where you're drilling. Okay. Um, the way Act 13 is written is within 3,000 feet, we have to notify folks that we're going to be drilling. And then within 2,500 feet is where we have to do the testing of any private water sources. So then if something happens, the DEP investigates, and they draw a conclusion that a company is responsible, then the company has to take care of whatever it is. They have a responsibility to do that. So those companies did test uh, DEP and Brain Resources was another company that tested, one of which found results and the other which did not. So they had two conflicting results. So when that happens, what follows through after that? Well, the DEP is responsible and has um, regulatory oversight here in Pennsylvania of all uh, investigations. So um, the direction that happens with the investigation is driven by the DEP. May I respond to that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, in the first place, <laughs> don't take it for granted that the DEP uh, is uh, on that family's or indeed the citizens of Pennsylvania's side. Uh, the principal agents started with Cranford, though he's now resigned. Uh, but the principal agents in DEP appointments by the Corbett administration are uniformly from the natural gas industry or the coal industry. So and DEP has been under considerable um, scrutiny um, because those agents are consistently caught in conflicts of interest. So you don't want to trust DEP. But more importantly, the, what the case law shows is that the fracking corporations, the fracking industry, will in fact resist tooth and nail um, it, of, of any agreement, any um, uh, concession that they are at fault for any kind of, for example, well contamination. They, they will resist it, the case law shows it. But even if there is compensation to the family, that compensation comes with an incredibly high price tag called a non-disclosure agreement. Where in fact, because they will have to sign a non-disclosure agreement that will indemnify the company against anyone ever finding out what it was that actually happened that contaminated their well, their stream, their killed their farm animals. Um, we, we, the public, won't have the benefit of knowing what actually happened. There is a case now in Pennsylvania um, that is in fact going to open um, and so we will actually see what a, what a family agreed to with respect to what was in the non-disclosure agreement and that will be very interesting litigation when we actually begin to see what happened to this family. Well, one of the things that you talked about in your, in your comments on your presentation was um, regarding the unsealing of the Hollowich case in Hickory, Pennsylvania. If you actually read the court record, you will find that the Hollowich family signed saying that there was no health effects directly related to drilling. And so I know a lot of activists and a lot of other folks like to point the fingers at range resources and say that, that um, there were health effects associated with it. But it, when in fact the Hollowich family actually signed documents stating that there were no health effects. Um, and the likelihood is that they did that under pressure and because otherwise they would not I can just say as a lawyer, one of the things that happens when, when somebody wants to settle a case is you sue a company and you say, you're liable to all these terrible things. They say, well, we'll pay you X amount of dollars if you agree to 
sign something that says we didn't have, we have no responsibility. That's a very typical thing that happens. I don't know what happened in that case, but it wouldn't surprise me that what happened in that case is what happens in many, many cases. Okay, well, I understand all that, but this woman was less than a mile away, 25,000 feet, probably. She had to sue before she could get any form of compensation. The 12 year old kid, Robert, he is still sick. He will have cancer more than likely by the time he's 20. That's not, there's, there's no grounds for it. When you get home, look up something called the list of the harm. Those are documented cases, well contamination, methane migration, other forms of cancer, all in our world. He was admitted on law He's still sick. And right. it, it is 9 o'clock.